wrong place there for a second. How are we all doing? Great to see each and every one of you here. Thank you for joining us today. It's an honor and privilege always to have you here. You could be a thousand different places, but in my opinion, you pick the very, very best one. Let's open up in prayer and dive straight into the message. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you. We just give you praise and glory for who it is that you are. We lift up your name, Lord, and we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your forgiveness. We thank you for this house. We thank you for our wonderful lead pastor and his beautiful family. Father God, we pray blessings over them, Lord God. And we just pray and thank you for all you are doing through this house and to this house. This place is amazing, Lord God. It's all because of you. We love you, God. We give you praise and we give you glory. And God, I ask that you use me again this morning. I pray as always that every word from my mouth is yours and not mine. I pray that people would listen with open ears and open mind and a softened heart, Father God. And I pray that lives will be changed forever today. I really pray that, Lord God. I pray that. And we're trusting in you for that. We love you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to see some of you as always. It's an honour and privilege to be uh, behind the pulpit here. Pastor has asked me just to continue on and carry on our Love Much series. I'm very, very excited about uh, the word that I have for you today. It's going to be a challenge for you today, so prepare yourselves. Uh, I'm going to be throwing out a couple of challenges for you today. And again, I say this more or less every time I'm up here. We believe very firmly that, you know, we're not here to kill time. We're not here to kill our time. We're not here to kill yours. You know, you made the decision and sacrificed to be here today, as did every person on this side of the fence, so to speak. And so we don't want anybody's time to be wasted. We believe firmly that we're not here just to throw the Bible and throw words at you, give you your weekly fix and have you go home. We're here literally uh, because we believe firmly that we should equip you. That's what we're called to do as a pastoral team. We should be equipping you, helping you, guiding you to do what? Well, to walk out your Christian walk. Because how many knows it's not easy? It's not easy to walk out. There's more of you that know that than that. But I'm the only one pastor apparently. Everybody else can see. Taxi. Look. It's not always easy to walk our Christian walk. So we believe here that we're supposed to equip you and help you and guide you to do that. So again, this message is going to be a challenge for you today. Uh, We're going to be carrying on with our Love Much series. Uh, Pastor's done an awesome job, set the bar very, very high already on the beginning part of this um, series. I know the messages have certainly challenged me. Uh, We've been speaking, initially we spoke about loving God much. We started off uh, talking about how we can do that. And the fact that the relationship with God, our relationship with God is the most important relationship in our lives. But you know, we're all guilty to some degree or another of maybe neglecting that relationship. Not always, not continually maybe. But certainly, you know, we have to actively and proactively make sure that that relationship is the most important one and that we are reflecting that in the amount of time that we spend in that relationship. You know, five minutes here and five minutes there certainly wouldn't work for my wife. If I was to do that every three or four days, give her five minutes of my time, it's not going to be a very strong relationship, a very strong bond. And that's the same, is that the same thing with a relationship with God? We need to be committed yeah. to that relationship, even more than we're committed to our marriage. Which might sound a strange, bizarre, weird thing to say, but that's absolutely true. Why? Because the time we spend investing in our relationship with God is never wasted. Yeah. It's never wasted. It will always come back and help us to actually love in other relationships as well. And then last week, uh, Pastor spoke about loving in the home, talked about how we're to love the people in our home better than we are doing right now. And that didn't just mean our spouses, it also meant our children. Pastor did an awesome job last week in actually putting that all into perspective for us. And it certainly, again, challenged me and my home life. But this week, I'm going to be talking about loving others. Loving others. So this is something that some of us do very well with some people. But there are very, very few of us that do this well with everybody. So it's something we all have a handle on. We can all relate to some degree or another. If I was to say to you, do you love anybody well? You'd probably say, yes. If I said to you, do you love everybody well? You would probably not say yes. And if you did, you might say through gritted teeth and ask for prayer for forgiveness afterwards. All right, so this message is going to challenge you, as I said. Hopefully, at the end of this message, you're only not, you're not going to only have a clear idea of what God wants from you in this area, but also how to go about achieving it. And I say that because loving other people well is something that I believe 
very possible for each and every one of us. It's something that we're all capable of, even if we're not doing it very well right now. It's something I believe. Loving other people, loving everybody the way that we are supposed to do, I believe is something that we are capable of doing. And I use that doing word very deliberately. Why? Because love is a doing word. Love is a doing word. Now when we hear the word love, it can conjure up in our minds the central me sentimental meaning of the word. It can, the roses, the chocolates, the dim lights, the romantic date night, the cuddling on the sofa, all of those things. And they are all definitely associated with love. And they can be used to display love to somebody. But love is more than just emotion and feelings. Love is an action word. In fact, get this, love being displayed properly will often go completely against the way that we feel yeah. in that moment. Yeah. Love being displayed properly can and should happen when we're upset or angry or disappointed yeah. or even afraid. Right. True love often actually defies how we feel because of this. True love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. It's a choice to love and to display love to somebody, irrespective of who, whoever that someone is or isn't to us, whatever it is that that someone has done for us or not, even what that somebody has done to us or not. We have the choice to love that somebody whether they deserve our love or not. So I'm going to touch more on that point a little bit later, but before that I want to underline the fact that every person here has the ability to love much when it comes to other people. You all have the ability to do it, whether you believe that or not. And I'm going to show that to you. But at the same time as that, I'm going to show you how important it is to God that we do that very thing. In the book of Matthew, chapter 22, it's a powerful chapter. And this is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're basically tag-teaming against Jesus. All right? They're all trying to catch him out. They're all trying to have him say something which will basically, the Bible says, they met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. So the Pharisees, uh, they give it the best job. They start off, they give it the first try in the morning. And Jesus slaps them down. And then the Sadducees come up straight after, the, after that. And they, again, try and catch him out. That doesn't work. So they go away. And it actually says that the crowds were astounded yeah. at his teaching. And the way that he responded to these questions being thrown out. So then the Pharisees come back for a second attempt. And this is what happens. Teacher, one of the Pharisees says, Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So Jesus answers the question by telling the Pharisee what the most important commandment is. Then a second commandment, which is just as important. And then he stresses how important both are by saying that the entire law of Moses are based on these two commandments. So before I expand on that point, I want you to notice this. These commandments include a general and non-specific, unqualified, you. You. You must. It doesn't say, you must if you are capable. Right. It doesn't say, you must if you feel like it. Yeah. It doesn't right. say, you must if things happen to go perfectly for you in the moment. Or if you're in a good mood with God that day. Or a good mood with your neighbour that day. It just says you must. So what does that tell me? Well as far as this verse goes, I'm a you and you are a you. I'm capable in God's eyes of doing these things and so are you. So that does tell me whether I do these things or not is a choice that I make. So how important is it that I make the choice to love others much? Let's look at verse 39 again. A second is equally important. Love your neighbour as yourself. Equally important as what? Love equally important as the most important commandment in the law of Moses. Wow. 
So it's safe to say, pretty important. God wants you to love Him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And at the same time, and with just as much importance, love others. So, we've established pretty clearly, I believe, that God wants us to love others. We've established clearly that God believes each and every one of us has the ability to do that very thing. And we've established that whether or not we do it is a matter of choice. Is everybody with me so far? Alright, so God wants me to love others. God believes I'm capable of doing so. And I need to choose to do it. But once I've made that choice, I make the choice that I want to love other people. Once I've decided to love others much... What does that look like? How should I do it? Well, Jesus answers that question for us in the book of John. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my my disciples, if you have love for one another. So how should we love others? We should love them as Jesus has loved us. Plain and simple. Jesus is clearly saying that here. He's saying, I have modelled how to love. Now, go and do it. Straightforward as that. And that's how people are going to know that you are my disciples. People are supposed to know that we are Christians by seeing the way that we love one another. Wow. Let me ask you. If somebody was watching you this last week, Every moment of every hour of every day for the last seven days. Could somebody point to you and say, that person is a Christian. I can tell them by the way that they love everybody that they came into contact with during that seven days. It's a challenge, right? It's a challenge for me, that's for sure. So, let's take a few moments to look at how Jesus loved, how he loves and that one was a clear picture of what our loving others should look like. And while we're there, we're also going to look at what it is that has possibly stopped us from displaying the same kind of love up to this point, and why we need to overcome those obstacles. And then before I close, I'm going to look at how, I believe, we can get better at what it is that God wants us to do towards other people. So, just some of the ways that Jesus loves. Firstly, he loves indiscriminately. Jesus loves indiscriminately. And he loved, in, the, in, in human form, he loved indiscriminately. It didn't matter who the people were, where it is that they came from, what their status of life was. He loved them. Look at this, Mark 2, 15 through 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We are called and required to love everyone, irrespective of who they are, or what our fleshly opinion of them might be. That is totally clear in God's Word. But one of those things that as Christians, we're prone to forget. Why is that? Well, because let's be honest, it's easier to forget that we shouldn't discriminate than it is to not discriminate. So in case you've forgotten, allow me to be the one to remind you this morning. You are required by God. In fact, you are commanded by God to love everyone. That means the person that you do not know at all. It means the person that you know too much about. It means the person that lives next door to you, drives you nuts with the loud music, or the barking dog, or the screaming kids. It's a person that works next to you, that curses every other word, or doesn't wear deodorant, or both. It's a homeless guy that you walk past outside Starbucks every day. It's the woman that looks like she's got it all together and drives that brand new Mercedes that you wish you could own. It's your black neighbour. It's your white neighbour. It's your Asian neighbour. It's your Mexican neighbour. That one that you just wish would speak English. It's your black president. It's your white president. It's people that you're offended by because you think that they are better than you. It's the people that you're offended by because you think that you're better than them. Everybody. 
zero discrimination. How's that for a challenge? That's what we are called and commanded to do. So what about the people who don't love me? How about the people who hate me? What about my enemies? Good question. Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. This is Jesus speaking. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Love your enemies. So while we're all digesting and processing that, let's move on to how else Jesus loves. He loves unconditionally. Jesus loves without condition. He loves us through whatever we do and whatever we don't do. He loves us even though we don't deserve it, because I know I don't. Here's another massive challenge for us. We are to love unconditionally. Now, our nature struggles with this one because we like to work on the basis of giving people what it is that they, we think they deserve. We've got no problem loving people if they've done what we believe deserves our love in return. If people do the opposite though, we want to give them what we think they deserve in return. We withhold our love. We hold it back as a punishment for what it is that they did or didn't do for us. If somebody is mean or aggressive towards us, our human response is often to be mean and aggressive back. And if we're not mean and aggressive back, we think we're doing a great job. Even if we're still withholding our love from them. We pat ourselves on the back back and think, well, what they deserve is me being cruel and harsh and violent and angry and shouting and cussing at them. And I'm not doing any of that, so I'm doing a great job. Well, are you actually loving them? Because until you're loving them, you're not doing a great job. You're doing a better job than you might have been doing, but you're not doing a great job. Maybe in your eyes you are. Maybe in your friend's eyes. That friend that you're telling all about it. That one that you're saying, well, he did this and he did that, so I did this and I did that, but you know what, I could have done a lot worse. And your friend is there saying, well, you know what, you did a great job, you're a real Christian. You did a great job by not doing this and not doing that and not doing the other. But what we need to do always is ask ourselves this, what does God think about this? I've learned this, another human is not qualified to judge my human response to any situation. Only God is. Only guys. So if your friend is patting you on the back and telling you what a great job it is that you're doing, two things. Firstly, ask God what he thinks. Secondly, think about the friends you keep. You need people who are going to be steering you towards a godly response in every situation. Love, listen to me, needs to be our response to love. And And love needs to be our response to hate. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offences. Love covers all offences. That includes, by the way, offences towards you. Just for clarification purposes. In case you were hearing that and saying, well, that doesn't count for me, it does count for you. Love should cover every offence, and it will do, if you allow it to, and if you make it happen that way. When someone says or does something bad towards you, the hardest thing to do, usually, is to actively love them back. But that's the very thing that will diffuse the situation the fastest. And it's the most effective way to diffuse the situation. Yeah. And you know it. Yep. How often have you been in an argument with somebody and then in hindsight you think, oh, just, I wish I'd dealt with that differently. Yeah. Next time, actively, proactively, act differently. If everything inside of you is screaming, punch this person in the face, yeah. smile at them. Say, you know, I love you. We need a time out right here. Because this is not going in the direction it needs to go. Yeah. Just diffuse the situation yeah. with love. Start from that place. You know, I read that scripture about, about it talking about that love covers all things. And I had this visual in my mind. Somebody coming at me with anger, anger and frustration with the, their fists clenched and that, that, that furrowed brown, that scowl. And somebody just coming at me. And then I get a huge, thick, fluffy blanket with the word love written right across it and throw it over the top of them. Now I'm not suggesting that we all go out and buy big, fluffy blankets, but what I am suggesting is this. How about next time somebody is coming at you like that, verbally or physically, that what you do is you verbally throw that blanket 
over the top of the situation. Throw the verbal blanket over it. Show him love. Love. It should be our default setting yeah. that is used in every single circumstance. Not, as I said, just in response to love. So how else does Jesus love? He loves sacrificially. We know this. Every Christian knows that Jesus died on the cross. Most Christians understand why he died on the cross to some extent. Many Christians can talk about the fact that he died on the cross for us. Few Christians love like Christ died on the cross. We all know it, but we don't live that out. 1 John 4, 10 through 11 says, This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. How powerful is that? How powerful is that that puts the whole thing in perspective? You know what? You're struggling loving your next door neighbor. It could be a lot worse. Jesus died on the cross for you. To remove your sins. That you would have freedom. That you would have the ability to love other people. Because our love for other people couldn't have come if Jesus had not done what it is that he did. We have that ability because of what he did. And so we should be using it. We should be using it. Loving sacrificially is again challenging. Let's be real about this. Sacri- being, doing anything sacrificially is difficult for us. Why is that? It's because we're not wired to do it naturally. Loving sacrificially is, again, it's a decision. It's something that we can be proactive in doing. And it's something that we can learn to do better and more often. It's something we can learn how to do. And the more that we do it, then the, the, the better we're going to get at it. And then it's going to become more and more natural. It's something that becomes easier, as I said, the more that we do it. And it's something that we do, not in our own strength. We do it in God's. We do it in God's strength and not in our own. Because my flesh is always going to go for the selfish option. Why? Because I'm wired that way. And I'm wired exactly the same way as you are wired. We are wired in such a way that selfish motives tend to come at least, at least first in our brain. We can then maybe actively kick them out and move that down the list. Alright, but it's, our natural default tends to be very, very selfish. Let's take a moment to dwell on why we should love this way. It's not about being put on a guilt trip. It's not about feeling the pressure because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But it is about having the right perspective. It's about understanding that if Jesus went through what he went through, then me loving someone sacrificially by doing for them instead of doing for myself pales into insignificance. There is zero I can do in my life short of carrying a cross on my back for miles and then getting nailed up upon it naked and having a spear stabbed in my side, everything else that I could possibly do for anybody falls short of that. So any sacrifice I make pales into insignificance compared to what it is that Jesus did for me. So loving sacrificially is something I believe. We can do that continually. It's something that's a way of life rather than one big thing. This is an... This is in the day to day. This is literally something you can do every morning. This is getting up and making your spouse a cup of coffee when you'd rather stay in bed. This is playing with your kids and running around the sofa for the 25th time when you'd rather sit down and watch the game. This is giving your last $5 bill to that homeless guy outside of Starbucks instead of going in there and buying yourself a coffee. Put simply, Loving sacrificially is putting other people before yourself. Paul writes of this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbour. Seek, 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 seek. That is a proactive word. That's an action word again. That's something you have to decide to do. You cannot seek anything without deciding that you are going to seek it. It says, seek the good of your neighbour. So each of us struggles in different areas of our Christian walk. Some of us find it easy in some areas where others struggle. But one thing that we all have in common is this, as I said, we have the ability to be selfish. Now some of us are better at it than others. Some of us are really good at being selfish. Some of us, you know, are, are, are less selfish less of the time, but we all have that talent of selfishness to some degree or another. There are many, many, many words that would describe Jesus Christ. Selfish is not one. 
selfish is not one. So how else does he live? Love, sorry. He loves forgivingly. There is nothing that reduces our ability to love like Jesus more than our inability to forgive like Jesus. Let me say that again. There is nothing that reduces our ability to love like Jesus more than our inability to forgive like Jesus. If we have unforgiveness in our heart towards somebody, it prevents us loving them the way that we are commanded to love them. Simple as that. You cannot have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody and love them the way that you are supposed to. It's impossible to do. Look what we're called to do as Christians. Put on them, Paul says, as God's chosen ones, that's you, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Can you see how love and forgiveness are completely intertwined? You cannot love the way that you are called to love while there is unforgiveness present. So unforgiveness is like a wall that blocks our love for others. And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier regarding conditional love. We hold our love back from those that we haven't forgiven because we don't think that they deserve our love. You might not know how to forgive somebody. Let me give you some advice on how to go about doing that. Decide to forgive them. Decide. Whatever it is that they did to you, let it go. You might be thinking, well, it's not that easy. I never said it was easy. I just said that that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. The only way that you can erase how you feel about what happened is to erase how you feel about what happened. Because you can't erase what happened. You can't go back and change it. But you can change how you feel about it. You can stop yourself from replaying this. Because here's what it is about unforgiveness. Somebody did something to you. There was two people present, you and them. You have gone away and you both of you remember it to some degree or another. The person who has hurt you or damaged you in some way may or may not think about the situation. They may or may not go back to it and think about it. And if they do, maybe their heart has changed now and they are embarrassed about it. Maybe they don't think about it at all. But if you have been on the receiving end of something and you were hurt by somebody, let me tell you, you remember it more often than they did. And let me tell you something else about it. Every time you think about it, and every time you remember about it, every single time, you feel exactly the same way as you did when it first happened. You are replaying the feelings, you are replaying the pain, you are replaying the torture, the discomfort, the anger, the frustration, the upset, you are replaying over and over and over again. You cannot change that it happened, but you can change the fact that you are being affected by it. And you change the way that you are being affected by it by not making it important anymore. And you make it not important anymore by forgiving them. You forgive them. You let it go. Because it's those feelings that cause us resentment and hurt that makes us feel that the other person doesn't deserve our forgiveness. Here's the reality. Because those things repeat and repeat, as I said, every time we recall the event, not forgiving somebody punishes us way more yeah. than it punishes yeah. them. Yeah, you need to recalibrate your heart. Yeah, you need to remove bitterness and unforgiveness from your heart. Here's another instruction on this in Paul's way to the church at Ephesus. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice. Who's he talking to? He's talking to a bunch of youths. He's talking to a bunch of people. He's saying to them, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Who's in control of that? Who can do that? Nobody but you. You are the only one that can put those things away. He goes on to say, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So by being commanded to love as Jesus did, we're commanded to love indiscriminately, unconditionally, sacrificially, and forgivingly. So let's look at this summary of what love should look like. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. You've all heard this scripture. But soak this in. 
Learn this. Understand what it is that it's telling you. This is very poetic. It's used at weddings. It's a great, lovely, sentimental, roses, cuddles on the sofa type description of what love is, but it's more than that. This is showing you what love should look like as an action yeah. word. Love is. That's lining it up and setting it up for what it is. It's going to tell you what love is. Love is. Patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist, insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And that is the love that Jesus modelled. And that is the love that we should display to others. So why don't we? What are some of the reasons that we fall short of what it is that God expects from us in loving others? What's stopping us from loving this way? Well, there's many things. But here are what I think are three main ones. Hurt. Our nature is such that when we get hurt, we protect ourselves. That's the way, again, that it is that we're wired. It's that in the nature of every living thing, that if they get hurt a certain way, they are cautious about getting hurt that way again. The next time your dog comes running down that, that pathway to you to greet you from work, kick it. When it comes back down the next day, kick it. It's not going to be very many days before it doesn't run down the pavement anymore. Why? Because it associates that pavement with you kicking it. So it's wired to avoid things which will hurt it. That was completely an example. Don't kick your dog. That was not an instruction, it was just an example. All animals do the same thing, and we are the same. If we put ourselves in a situation and we get hurt, then we are cautious the next time we put ourselves in that situation. And if we get hurt again, then we're not likely to even put ourselves in the same situation and position. When we've been hurt in a relationship, we're more cautious the second time around and even more cautious the third time around. Now if you cut your hand badly and it heals, and then you cut it again in the same place again, it's gonna heal even thicker and with a callus that's harder to cut through a third time. And our emotional heart can be the same way. Each time it gets hurt, it becomes harder and it becomes more callous. Yeah. Yeah. We protect ourselves from the hurt coming in, but in doing so, we prevent the love from coming out. Yeah. Right. The fact is, not that this is easy, I'll get that. We shouldn't let how we've been treated in the past limit how we treat other people now. Yeah, Don't let how you have been treated in the past yeah. limit how you treat people now. Good. Second thing that stops us, fear. Fear comes in all shapes and sizes and it can stop us from loving the way that we're called to do because again, we naturally base what we do on what response we are likely to get. Yeah. Loving totally, unconditionally, would mean that we would love irrespective of what the response towards us is going to be or is possibly going to be. And that's tricky because we're laying ourselves right out there. Yeah. Yeah. You are walking into a relationship, you are loving somebody unconditionally. What you are basically saying is, is listen, I love you. Yeah. And not only am I here completely open to you for you to do what you want to with me, but you, help, you can hurt me, you can love me back, you can hurt me. Not only am I here in this position, but I am loving you. And I will love you irrespective of what you choose to do when I'm in this position. You're laying yourself bare, you're putting yourself out there, you're saying, hurt me if you like. Treat me badly if you like. But you know what, I'm going to love you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's what unconditional love is about. Is that easy? No, it's not easy. Are we commanded to do it? Yes. That's exactly how it is that we're called and commanded to love. It's fear of the unknown. You don't know how the person is going to react, it doesn't matter. They're either going to react well or they're going to react badly. Either way, you are called to love them anyway. Yeah. Fear of rejection, another huge one. Yeah. When it comes to loving people, again, yeah. this is making our love conditional. Yeah. Whichever way you dress it up, that is conditional loving. Because what you're saying is, I'm only going to give you my love if you accept it. But that's not what it's about. What they do with my love is irrelevant. Yeah. It's up to me to give them that love. They're going to accept it, or they're going to reject it. And neither of those things should make me love them any differently. Can you see how important this is? And yet how difficult 
this is if we're doing it in our own flesh. Love unconditionally will look more like this. Here's my love, I'm loving you and I don't care what you do with the love I'm giving to you, but I am giving you it with no strings and no expectations attached. Which leads me to the last reason that we don't love the way we're called to. Unrealistic and hypocritical expectations. One of the most amazing things that I've noticed about human nature, and I'm including myself in this, but being a pastor and speaking with people, and just being around people and loving people and just being seeing people in their worst and in, in their most hurt states. One of the most amazing things that I've seen, and not amazing in a good way, is how able we are to expect and demand something from other people that we are not doing ourselves. It's 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 everywhere. It's, all, it's in all of us to some degree. And how able we are to judge people for things that they are doing when we're doing the same things or different things that may be even worse than what the other person is doing. Yeah. We have that, again, we have that in us. Who someone is, what they do, what they have been doing in the past, the way that they speak, the way they dress or don't dress, the way they smell, the way they react to us, the list goes on and on. None of that should stop us from loving them. It may stop us hanging out with them. And using God with wisdom, it may even make us be cautious to be around them. Oh, if there's somebody who is a danger to you in some way or another, or a danger to your lifestyle in some way or another, I'm not telling you to hang out with them. Yeah. I'm not telling you to go where they go and do what they do. Because you can love them without doing any of that. Yeah. Love has different ways of expression. But you can love them. And one of the first ways that you love them is if they are the kind of person that you would never hang around with because they are doing this or doing that or going there or going here. You will love them and you will not judge them Amen. for doing this yeah. and doing yeah. that and going here and going there. Because again, you can't judge somebody and love them the way that you are supposed to love them. It's impossible to judge someone and love them the way that they are supposed to be loved. Yeah. So when it comes to close relationships that we have, with our families, with our kids, with our spouses, them not meeting our expectations in an area should never prevent us from loving them in the exact same way as if they had met the expectations. The expectations that shouldn't have been put there in the first place. We all have them. We all have expectations. I have expectations of my wife. She has expectations of me. And you know what? I fall short often. She falls short, often. But we're called to love each other as though we didn't fall short. As though I've got to love her, as though she's perfect. And she, bless her heart, has to love me as though I'm perfect. That's a tough one. You're talking about challenge? But that's how it is that we're supposed to love each other. And our kids. And our kids, you know, we're called to train our kids, to bring our kids up in the right way, to teach them, to coach them. Because, you know, they don't know better, do they? Elijah is four right now, and he's doing things which your average adult wouldn't do, and we're continually coaching Kobe, who's 15 years of age, and has got a lot more sense, and common sense, and a lot more life experience than Elijah has. But Kobe, because Elijah, you know, likes to be in the mix with stuff, Kobe will often talk to Elijah as though Elijah is 15 years of age. He will poke fun at him, he will argue with him, he will do all the kids things that kids do, you know, you go into the youth room and the, and the kids are banter going on. He's trying that with a four-year-old. So we're continually saying, look, he's four. What does that mean? It means he knows less. Yeah. But we are to coach them and teach them. And we have expectations of Kobe, and we have different expectations of Elijah. It would not be fair for me to treat Elijah based on how he's fallen short of the expectations that I have on Kobe. Yeah. And yet some of us do that. Some of us have expectations on our family that we would never have of anybody else. And I'm not saying don't stretch your family, don't coach your family, don't teach your family. But what I am saying is this. Don't withhold love from those people when they are not doing 100% of what it is that you need them to do 100% of the time. You will be holding love back every day of the week. So, we've looked at the way that we're supposed to love. We're supposed to love as Jesus loves. We've looked at some of the things that are stopping us from doing that, but how can we get better at it? How can we love like Jesus loves? I'm going to take a second and look at part of the first scripture that we looked at today. Matthew 22, this time verses 37 38. It says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first 
and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here's why I want to look at the scripture again. Because it's my belief. If we get our vertical relationship with God right, our horizontal relationships with other people will improve. I believe that the more consistently we fulfill the first commandment of loving God, the more equipped we become to fulfill the second of loving others. The more loving our relationship is with God, the more loving our relationships with people will be. The more open we are to receive God's indiscriminate, unconditional, sacrificial and forgiving love, the more we are able to give those things to those around us. Here's what I believe. The amount of love we have to give horizontally is determined by the amount of love we accept vertically. The more we accept God's love, God loves me so much, I can't keep up with it. I can't contain it. So if you're pouring anything into a glass that can't contain what you're pouring in, it overflows. Love, God loves me so much, I don't deserve His love. But His love is unconditional, it's indiscriminate. I don't deserve it. But the love that He pours into me, the more I accept that, then that's going to overflow. It's going to overflow where? It's going to overflow into my horizontal relationships. Don't try so hard to do what it is that you think God wants you to do. Try instead to let God do what God does through you. Don't do what you you think He wants you to do. Allow God to do what He does through you. Love other people with His love, not yours. I want people. I want people to feel God's love. I don't want people to feel mine. Me showing my love for somebody, you know what? It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, and it may change somebody's day. But me showing God's love, that can change the life. That can change the life. You know, we can't give what we don't have. Our loving others starts with accepting God's love. Listen to me. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you indiscriminately. Whoever you are. He loves you unconditionally. However your life looks right now. He loves you sacrificially. He died on the cross to pay the price for your sins so that you may be saved. And He loves you forgivingly. Everything that you have done. Whatever that may be, His love and His death has wiped your slate clean and you are forgiven if you accept His love. If you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. If you accept that indiscriminate, unconditional, sacrificial, forgiving love. Your life will be changed. Don't you hate that word is poison? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you. We thank you that your love is indiscriminate, it's unconditional, it's sacrificial, and that you've forgiven each and every one of our sins for those of us who have accepted your Son as our Lord and Savior. I pray that each and every one of us would take something from today's message, Lord God, and apply it to our lives. That we would just be so conscious of what we're called and commanded to do by you, which is to love others the way that Jesus loved us, the way that Jesus loves us. I pray that we would think, that we would be proactive, that we would each make a decision, because that's what it takes. True love is a decision. I don't pray that we would do that. We love you, God. And we praise you. Let's all your heads bowed. I said to you that we have to accept God's love. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life. If you're in a place right now where
when you don't know what that looks like. You have been so, so kind. If you never actively decide to accept God's love into your heart. If you want to make that choice right now, if you're going to decide that from this moment forward you're going to accept that love, then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you right now, let's bring head bow and every eye closed, or you to raise your hand for it, nice and high if you want. Anybody here who wants to accept that love the way that they've accepted it before, thank you. Thank you. Father, I love you. I want to thank you, God, for your sacrificial love, for your indiscriminate love, for your unconditional love, and for your forgiving love. Right now, God, I accept your Son, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And I profess, God, that He died for me and he rose again to wash away my sins. Thank you, Lord, for saving me with your reckless love. I promise to give you my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And Amen. Just go to the time of worship. What can I do to prepare 
this week for the Heart for the House, February the 25th. And if you are here for the first time, please go and visit someone at the Connect Zone. We want to welcome you to the family. We have a special gift that we want to give you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for your reckless love that was given to every one of us. We thank you that you leave the 99 to go after the one. And God, we thank you today for that because we are the one that you found. And God, we thank you, God, for those who have made their lives right with you today. We thank you for salvation, God, and a heart change, God, that will leave us completely different. And God, we pray that, God, we would take that difference to our world this week. Come on, help us and teach us. Show us, God, how to love the unlovable, God. Show us and teach us, God, the importance, God, of reaching out and touching other people. God, we thank you, God, today. We love you today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Name. Come on, shout amen in the house. If you want a special prayer, if you need anything like that today, please make your way forward. If not, God bless. Have a great week.